Mr. Tripp. Did you fly or did you drive? Sorry, sorry. You voice. You're thinking about Did you fly Brown's one? Uh, yeah. Did you fly Brown's one? Uh, uh, how's it going? Uh, 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 I'm getting Jordan Hill. Hi. <laughs> Camera's not on yet. <laughs> Can we already go see her? We had a great time. I'll pick up my mic over here. Settle, we're ready? Can I read the call? Please read the call. Notice of joint meeting of the, of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville and the Public <coughs> Utilities Board. Pursuant to Chapter 551, Title 5 of the Texas Government Code, Texas Open Meetings Act notice is hereby given to the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, in accordance with Article 5, Section 12 of the Charter of said city, will convene a special joint meeting with Brownsville Public Utilities Board on Tuesday, April 20th, 2010, and a workshop at 5 p.m. and a regular meeting at 6 p.m. at the City Commission Chambers on the second floor of the Brownsville City Hall Federal Building located at 1001 East Elizabeth Street, Brownsville Cameron County, Texas. Workshop item A, Brownsville Public Utilities Board Overview of Operations, five-year capital improvement plan and rate study, and workshop <coughs> item B, Public Utilities Board Water and Wastewater Utility Systems Project Financing Plan. Good afternoon. Noe Hosea for the record, with the Australian Housing Company. My partner, uh, Larry Jordan, is also with me, and he represent, represents our firm in representing PUB as financial advisor. Um, hopefully by this time you should have given, or you should have received uh, a packet um, that we presented to the PUB board about a month or two ago. And I remember having a workshop session with some of you, I guess six months ago maybe. Uh, and I've, I've, it was a joint meeting then too, and I felt like uh, that presentation didn't do as well. And, or didn't go as well, and I hope that today you have at least uh, a better perspective, globally at least, from a mac macro level, as to how PUV is run and how it affects uh, what we try to do here day to day in terms of uh, city uh, matters. Uh, oops. I see. Okay. So basically, I want to take you real quick to a little bit of history. Uh, I know some of you may have been here, some of you may have not, but back in, in 2005, um, the city uh, commission, uh, and even prior to that, wanted to sort of achieve some sort of a uh, uh, seamless uh, and more transparent way of, of operating PUB, especially related to, to uh, the way the city conducts, uh, the way the PUB conducts its business, and, and importantly, that uh, the city uh, or the PUB would have sufficient liquidity in its operations in case of, uh, of an act of God, in case of a bad storm hitting through here, and you not know, having the system in, in a good financial condition. Uh, so there were also concerns along the lines of, of the kind of debt that PUB had. Um, PUB, uh, over the last 10, 20 years, has had debt the ranges between 150 to, to 400 million dollars. And I'm gonna walk you through that in a minute as to the kind of debt we have outstanding. But back then, <coughs> we, had a, we had debt that was on a variable rate mode. And what I mean by variable rate mode is that um, the debt that the PV had was very short and, it, and the interest rates would be uh, basically varying within a month, within weeks, within 270 days. So whatever the rate would be this week, it could change the following week. And although they, uh, they were at the time lower, in fact, they even today lower than a fixed rate, we felt that it was in the best interest of the city to have its utility system have all of its debt on a fixed rate basis. So today, that debt at the PUV is, is fixed rate. But having said all that, we went from having level and extended debt with fixed interest rates, uh, and what it did, that's what we did. 
took, took out level and extended that with interest with fixed rates. And we took out the spikes in debt service, meaning that we had payments that were higher in some years than others in the future, and that, that we matched the useful life of the assets. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, you want to have the debt outstanding equaling whatever it is that you finance. If you finance a water line, a water treatment plant, you don't want to go out with a loan that is 25 years and the plant only lasts 20. So we had to match all that, and that was done back in 05. We reduced the variable rate exposure and increased reserve <coughs> funds. What that did is re reduce the interest rate fluctuation risks and provided more cost certainty and increased liquidity. In other words, we were concerned that the PUB didn't have enough cash reserves in case of a bad event. So it's kind of like you and I. You, you and I run a business. You get unemployed, and if you don't have a savings account, you're going to have some challenging times to make your mortgage payments, to make your you know, just daily life operational costs. So we wanted to make sure that, that we would provide that kind of liquidity to the PUB. We implemented a new ordinance, which basically uh, increased flexibility and streamlined the flow of funds. And, and what, what we mean by that, <coughs> basically, uh, which leads to the next point, it, it just basically provided a more clear and transparent way of, of operating. Uh, we felt that, that the increased flexibility was more uh, related to, uh, to the city ensuring that, um, uh, that you knew just by looking at a financial statement on how the PUB really operates, how revenues and expenses are taken out back and forth so that whenever the PUB needed you, you'd be there to support them in terms of rate adjustments. Uh, the three things that, that the commission does for the PUB board are literally three things. One is you appoint their members. Two is you authorize any debt issuance. And three, you, you approve rate increases or rate adjustments. Does, in essence, that's what the commission has over them. What the PUB board does for you, they're supposed to oversee the daily operations of the system. So we felt that, that by having a, a more transparent way of you understanding the ordinance, that you will be there to support them. So that was achieved back in 05. And going back to how it all worked, back in 05, there are three pies, literally. And if you look at the pie, on the top left hand corner, that's what the PUB looked like before 2005, where at the time we had about $325 million worth of debt outstanding, and about 100 and, well, you can see 179 and 27, about 310 of that debt, let me say 210, I'm sorry, about $210 million of that debt was very short and in variable rate mode. So it was kind of like one of these days, we're going to go out and borrow 20 year debt, fix it. And when they were sending us transfers, well, a lot of it, a lot of those transfers are based on how the rates on those loans uh, were being pegged at. And a lot of times, we were finding out that they were not paying principal payments either. So the commission at the time felt like, look, let's fix this up. Let's make sure that we have certainty, that we're not postponing our agony here of one day being surprised and that we can't afford this debt. So today, the pie at the bottom we went through the series of mechanisms, and in 09, <coughs> we have everything on a fixed rate basis. I think uh, we got 25-year debt out there, if not even a, a little less. Uh, and it's got an interest rate on average of 464.9. That 4.649 is not one rate for all the bonds. It's, that's the average of all the bonds that we have outstanding. At the very bottom, there's a little footnote that says does not include seven and a half million dollars of commercial paper with interest rates of 0.33 basis points. Outside of this debt, the PUB has the permission from you to access what we call commercial paper. And commercial paper is sort of like a credit card. You're giving them the authority to use the credit card up to $50 million any, during the, the course of the year. But any time that they go over 50, they have to fix it. And that's not a condition you've given, you given them. That's basically a condition that the credit markets require them to have, that they can't have any more than 50 million. Mm -hmm. So think of it like this, that Mr. Bruziak and, and so his colleagues have a, a credit card and they can go spend 50 million. Well, up to today, they only have used it seven and a half million. Three years ago, 
the PUB had an opportunity to, uh, to buy uh, additional equity into the Oakland Union plant. The Oakland Union plant, you could say, is probably the largest plant that we have that we're generating the most electric power from. And we had an opportunity to expand our equity <coughs> position, our partnership, our, own, our ownership. Well, the only way we could do it was by having that commercial paper, that credit card available. It cost us about 40 million plus, and in a moment notice, the PUB came to the commission with our recommendation, and the commission at the time said, hey, this, is, this sounds like a good business deal, you should do it, and we went ahead and did it. And today, uh, I think John will, can, can elaborate more than I can, but that's proved to be a, a very significant addition to the, to the PUB, and maybe even the mayor, for that matter, can tell us that, uh, or we'll share with you too, that it's just, it was just a good, a good decision to have made because that Oakley Union plant produces power with commodity with a product that is coal, and that's, that's probably the cheapest way of producing electric power. And what happens is when you, you, when you produce that kind of electric power, you can turn around and sell it at a price that is higher than the norm, than gas-generated power, and, and thus uh, uh, the city enjoys of a good profit there. Well, as, as we fix that debt, this is what your debt this is what your mortgage payments look like, basically. They're different colors, and uh, the yellow one, you could say, is, a, is a, the base, the foundation of, of all the debt of the PUB in terms of, there's an 05 financing, you got a little purple, a little orange and all that. The sum of all those columns is shy of about $23 million. And as you can see, then you have a spike on or about 2015, and it stays kind of that level, and it drops all the way out to 2032. Uh, so in essence, when we are helping <coughs> PUB bring out debt, we take this into account, that there is existing mortgages uh, outstanding, and uh, basically those are the annual payments. Uh, when, uh, when we went about there was a concern about too much debt. To us, the concern wasn't about debt. The concern was more of the system's ability to, to deal with adverse environmental or weather conditions. And some of the things that, <coughs> that the PUB at the time didn't have by contract with bondholders were very concerning to us. And I'll give you an example. The very first column, or the very first row on the top, it's an operating reserve fund. This operating reserve fund equals to your fund balance, to your, when you look at your, at the city's general fund operations, at the very bottom, you always ask Mr. Gonzalez, or maybe he's telling you, here's our fund balance. Well, that's what that is. Operating reserve fund is basically an operating reserve fund balance. And at the time, <coughs> they literally had about $2 million they had more than $2 million, but the ordinance only required for them to have not less than $2 million. We told them at the time that they should be more like at $12.5 million, two months. So today, when some of you, out of curiosity, get into the website, oh, when they uh, uh, took this uh, allergy medicine, it's real dried up. Um, when, they, when, when you take a look at their <coughs> audits at PUB, you're gonna find that a lot of their funds are restricted or maybe even unrestricted. And what I'm trying to do today with you is to kind of give you a good picture what is restricted and what is not. But what I, what I also want you to know is that even though you look at these numbers and they're huge numbers, a lot of these numbers are there for a, pur for a reason, a purpose. The first one, as I say, on that row, at the very far right-hand column, you see 16 million four. That 16 million four is sort of like uh, it's sort of like the cushion that you have there in case revenues drop. And people say, well, what can cause revenues to drop? Well, not long ago, we have a client just uh, further up the road, a Laguna Madre Water District that serves South Padre Island and, and Port Isabel. And when Dolly hit, he hit right smack in the middle of South Padre Island. Well, 
they had to shut down water lines, sewer lines, so on and so forth. They lost revenues, and they also had to go out and make improvements on the spot for, uh, <coughs> on the spot for, uh, uh, for capital improvements. So what happened was that in a matter of a year, these people not only spent $2 million for capital ex expenses, they also had to have their budget reduced literally by $2 million. So that was a $4 million hit. But that's only a, a seven to maybe $11 million budget. The budget for the PUV is much greater than that. So what we tried to do there was to provide the PUV with a fund balance, an operating reserve fund, under contract with the bondholder that will have at least $12.5 million. Today we have $60 million for. <coughs> debt service reserve funds. This debt service reserve fund is sort of the, a fund that is there for also rainy day, but only to pay bond debt service. In 2005, the markets were okay if an insurance company will sell you an insurance policy to cover that debt service reserve fund. Today, it's impossible. Today, you're required to put cash in there because the insurance companies, as you probably have heard about what's going on in New York and Wall Street, uh, have literally disappeared. There's only one uh, sure guarantee that it's in the business. But today, PUB doesn't have any money there. So when you see all this, all this, uh, all this uh, 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 cash out there, we worry that we don't have a debt service reserve fund. And as we go about issuing new debt, like I think uh, in a couple of years, we may be coming, maybe sooner, I don't know, uh, coming with a revenue bond issue for PUV, there will be a reserve fund component in the bond issue. And that's how we intend to slowly build that reserve fund. So right now, as of 09, it has zero. The, zero, the city transfer up to 50% of net revenues after some deductions. I'm reading the third row, I'm on the second column, what the previous ordinance said. That was very subjective. Now, you can't believe, I think I owe some of my gray hair to that provision of the one ordinance because there were times where the city commission felt that the PUB was being too subjective on how much money they were to give to us at the city commission. And I, and, and I don't see it as a gift. I see it as the commission being the investor, being the owner of this asset. And that, that asset, if producing revenues, you're entitled to some sort of dividend or some sort of distribution. So at the time, the distribution was very nebulous and, and if, 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 the, if they were having a good day, they would they give us what we were asking. Well, we thought, let's make that more subjective, or objective, I'm sorry. And, um, and basically, the current ordinance today says 10% of adjusted gross revenues of the system. So today, in, I guess in, in uh, 09, we must have received cash about 6,381,000. Is that correct? Uh, okay. So basically, that's not an amount that is there sitting on the fund. That's actually the distribution given to the city. Okay. <clears throat> so then the, the next item is capital reserve fund. We talk about surety bonds. That's what the old uh, ordinance uh, didn't have. Now we do have it. And my point to you there on the capital reserve fund is that back in the day, they, we, we didn't know how they, they funded the capital reserve fund. Today, we, we asked actually, we accumulated $50 million uh, initially funded in five equal deposits of three million. And today, the PUB has $50 million. In fact, they've done so well, there's a little footnote at the bottom of that page, and that's intriguing for you to know, that because of the PUB having done so well, they actually have about $28 million on top of the 15. And if you remember, Mayor, we were there together, and some of you on this commission, there were concerns about borrowing money all the time. And we like to pay for this, some of these improvements with cash. Well, that's today, PUB makes a lot of its improvements on capital improvement plans out of that fund, out of that $28 million that is currently there. What was important was that when we did all this master restructuring, as I call it, back in the day before 05, those are the rating agencies and how they valued or how they viewed your credit ratings, the credit quality of the instrument. And back in the day, you could literally say, 
everything was in low A category, even BAA1, and today, as we speak, we're in the solid A category. If you ask me what is the difference in rates, if you were, if you were at the rating in 05, today, I would say, Larry, what, about 30, 40 basis points? So in other words, if you borrow 10 million bucks, it will cost you annually about $40,000 a year for borrowing those $10 million. But, but you don't borrow for one year. You borrow out 30 years. So you just multiply that, and you see what the cost of the value <coughs> is of the money for having those two ratings. And that's, a, that's an asset that you all have worked really hard to sustain. And frankly, because of those covenants that we have in the bond agreements, uh, you have those ratings. And, uh, uh, they're all stable, there's no negative credit watch, there's no, there are no concerns out there. Now I'm gonna take you to the assets, to the, to the financials of the PUV. Uh, you've had people come before you and tell you we have a lot of debt for PUV. And this is the balance sheet, five-year history, directly out of the official documents given to PUV by an independent auditor. And I just want you to look at, at the line that reads uh, total liabilities. In 05, you had $392 million of liabilities. Today, we have about $375 million of liabilities. The total liabilities and net assets in 05 were $631 million. Today, we're at $702 million. Well, you have a system that is literally worth $700 million in 09, and you got that of 327, well, I'm sorry, 375, meaning that the value of the system, you could probably peg it at $300 million. So you have all this investment out there, it's literally on a 50-50, you got as much debt as you have equity in it, and it's a very good ongoing concern that pays you about $10 million a year, and I'm gonna get to you how you get your $10 million in a minute. But the next page, the balance sheet is the worth of your asset. The next page is your, um, sorry, I think I went a little bit. Yeah, revenues and expenses. This is your operating annual revenue. One thing is how much I'm worth, the other thing is how much money do I make every year. And this is an asset that makes, year, makes money year after year after year. And as you can see there in 05, <coughs> we had revenues of about $162 million. And today in 09, or the year that used to elapse, uh, we had about 173 million. But look at the big number in 08. 221 gross revenues, it dropped to 173. He said, what happened there? Uh, I'm not a, an expert on, on, on uh, what would you call that, wholesale, wholesale sales? Uh, but basically, because of where our plants are situated, we got Oakley Union is up on the Texas-Oklahoma border. The way power comes down to Brownsville, it really doesn't come down to Brownsville. We actually sell it up there to someone close by, and then we trade it for a, a purchase down here. And what we have here, I think, is an excess of production by our plants, and we sell it in the spot market for a profit. So the more sales we have, the better for us it is in terms of determining transfers to the city. So what is important to you is when you're looking at, at the scaffers, is that there is a, a, a row called adjusted gross revenues. In 05, the fiscal year 05 number was about nine, $91 million. And uh, if, if you were to have had that, uh, uh, I guess, um, the formula today, the 10% of adjusted gross revenues, back in 05, you should have received 9,100,000. Actually, you got 11 million. So you're probably saying, well, we had a better deal going before. Well, what was going before, though, was a lot of uh, emotional and very subjective ways of, of, uh, of how much money you should have. And we wanted to eliminate that. So after 05, if you look at the adjusted gross revenue number, which is uh, $108 million in 06, the city got 10%. And that 10% comes by, by, by two functions. One is how much power is used in, this, in these buildings, 
along the streets and so on and so forth. And we take a deduction of that usage and then we give you, or the PV gives you cash. And as you can see, the cash value went from 05 of 3 million seven to 4 million six in 06 to 4 million one dropping in 07, then back to 4 million six, and then last year in 09, you got 4 million two two seven. Again, it's a, it's a number that comes to you net, uh, um, comes to you net, and, and as you can see that the green number, I believe, is the, uh, what the PUV transfer is to the city in terms of cash, and the, and the orange number is what you actually consume. So we have, uh, in times past, we met with your city staff, we've tried to institute energy conservation measures so that not only you conserve in energy, but also the less you consume at the city, the more of a cash transfer you get. So uh, again, uh, people have asked me, uh, you know, how do you feel about, the, about adjusting water, sewer rate, electric rate increases, or making adjustments to those rates? Uh, I, there's a page 11 in here that was sort of kind of like out of order a little bit. But I wanted to show you what makes the revenues for the PUV system. And it's kind of like having uh, three kids and, and, and you're the mom or the dad and, and you're wondering, well, who's gonna help me more if I get into a financial bind? And it's pretty obvious that, that the electric uh, system is what carries the PUV. Uh, literally, uh, when you look at the uh, audit for 09, you have 170 million of, of total revenues and about 130 is electric. And then you got water and wastewater generating a little over 10% of the entire revenue. So, so when somebody comes and tells you, well, I wanna do this increase for water or sewer or electric, you know that it's gonna take a lot less of a rate increase on the, on the electric to capture more dollars. And vice versa, if, 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 if uh, they wanna do a water wastewater increase, well, you're gonna have to raise more rates to make up for, for the dollars that you may need for the entire system uh, than if you were to do the electric. So, I mean, those are considerations that only a policymaker can, can play with. And I thought this will give you a perspective of, of as in the ensuing months come together, how you can apply some of those rate adjustments going forward. Um, Then uh, we wanted to just share with you what the, uh, what the budget looks like for 2010. And uh, I don't see any surprises there, other than the fact that, uh, and I don't know if it's reflected in this page, uh, Leandro, but one of the things that we did this year in lieu of the fact that you were ch having challenges last summer with your operating budget at the city was that we asked the PUB for help and maybe making available to us in case sales tax were to drop for about $3 million. And uh, basically, in addition to the, to the cash transfer that as you can see is calculated at the very bottom, they're expecting, and I don't know Pete Gonzalez if, if that's what you have in your budget, 5 million three. So you're anticipating getting the 5 million three. A lot of things are gonna happen in the course of the year that you may get 5 million three, or you may get less, or you may get more. But that cash transfer doesn't include the $3 million uh, that were put aside. No. Yes, sir. So you're deducting what you gave us? I'm sorry? You haven't really given us the $3 million. Right? I don't think we made the request yet, uh, Commissioner. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, Pete? A million and a half has been transferred. Is, is, that, is that correct, Pete? Has been transferred from, from PV. From $3 million. <coughs> And then there was another transfer, about a million and a half, no? Yes. Uh, there was a, a settlement uh, made uh, to the. I had PUB. nothing to do with that. Are you all calculating that? No, that's not included in here. Yeah. So, I mean, this year in 09, in, I'm sorry, in 2010, you should be getting on top of the 5 million three. Uh, let me ask you something yes, real sir. quick on that, yeah. on that settlement. What, what case was that? Care to elaborate that, John? But what was it? Who was it against? I think it had it was to do, AV? 
to the extent that we can, uh, I guess this, it had to do with the Oklahoma Union plan. E excuse me, Commissioner, there were some confidentiality provisions of that settlement, and that's, yeah, I, I just think. I want to know who it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. You do want the whole public to know. But if they could come back at us and hold us. I'll deal with that. Um, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's what the landscape is for 2010. Uh, I want to take you to the history, literally, of the last 30 years in terms of the commission supporting the PUB and adjusting those rates. And as you can see here, we literally haven't done anything since 2006 in terms of giving more rate adjustments. And, uh, and there is a history, water, wastewater always goes up much, much higher, especially in the early years, because uh, to raise 36% of zero is, is really difficult. <laughs> it's not very much, but then uh, at one point, I thought, uh, John, we would have ordinances coming here with perennial increases that have to come to the commission, right? You like it, okay, we never did. So every year that you want an increase, you have to come to the commission. So, so, so that was the way the commission would act in the past. So what my point to you is, when, when you're borrowing money in the private markets, the lender, is judging your ability to pay back literally on two components, on your ability, on how much money can you really generate. In fact, uh, there's a little page that we had covered earlier, and I skipped it very quickly. But um, if you go back to page 10 real quick, um, there's, a, there's a row in there that has like a little X. It says debt service coverage ratio, 339, 283, 250, 306, 239. What that is is the number of dollars that are available to pay your mortgage in excess of your mortgage. So if your mortgage is 10 and you're out there uh, uh, coming up with $33 of profits, the lender mm -hmm. takes into account that coverage component. In order to be able to sustain the credit rating of an A, you got to be at about two times or better. So as you can see over the last five years, we've been very consistent. We've been at two times or better. In 09, it dropped to 239. That's a function of your rates, a function of the cost of operating the PUB, uh, the cost of, of buying power or, or selling power. So my point to you is that when you go and borrow money, you're judging your willingness and ability. This demonstrates ability. My ability is I can cover my mortgage payments two and a quarter times or three times if I'm having a good year. Your will is reflected on literally what are you willing to charge to make your payments, and that goes to page 15, in that since 06, we haven't had an adjustment in rates, and that's why the issue comes up. You need to help us to sustain those coverages, okay? So uh, then what we did in order to attempt to, uh, to give you a bigger picture, and we wanted to see how you stood uh, in terms of your residential electric charge with other providers in the valley. And as you can see, PUB, based on numbers that we have as of uh, I think it was uh, this year or this month, but this PUB uh, existing rate for 1,000 kilowatt hours is $93.86. And look at Magic Valley, which is at MVEC, Reliant, TXU, CPNL. So you need to take, take care of, uh, you know, I, I want you to, to look at your business. The PUB business is your business. And when people say to you, well, McAllen charges me less water and sewer than you all do, you know, uh, Harlingen may say that. This is a competitive business that you're in. But none of them have what you have, and that's this asset. So what I wanted to sort of share with you too is that try to run it as a business, that if you're lower than they are, or if you're higher than they are, be aware of where you're lower and where you're higher. And if, the, if you are lower, think of it like this. Is your business, is a business that you are in forever? I don't know, if I haven't heard anybody thinking about selling it. But if you're going to be in it forever and you're leaving 
look at the rate between Magic Valley and you, it's $10. Then you go to a private operator like Reliant, PXU, CPNL. Those guys are higher than us by 40 bucks. You have to determine as to whether, do I want to leave all that money there on the table in lieu of the fact that I may need to repair an electric plant in year five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now? Should I be accumulating cash reserves today so that when I get to go and do what I need to do, I don't have to borrow as much money. That's part of the business consideration and component that plays in here as to when you look at what is your competition doing versus you. No, I thought we were gonna use a lot of that weird dab money to go toward that sewer plant. Uh, I'm not gonna get into those issues, Commissioner. I think uh, uh, they, uh, Leandro and John will uh, elaborate on that. I'm just trying to give you, right now I'm trying to get you a big picture. Well, when you start talking about the economic model, if you're leaving that forty, fifty dollars in the consumer's pocket, yeah. then they're going to go out and then they're going to buy things with that, sure. and we're going to generate sales tax. Sure. And so you're you're picking that money up at a different level. It becomes a question: Does it go back into PUB, or does it come into the city's revenue directly through sales tax? My my only concern, uh, Commissioner, is that you need to be aware. My I'm not no, no. coming here and to tell I you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm not coming here to tell you this is what you should do, but think about it like this: If you have an electric plant need in five years or eight years from now. Oakley Union has been a great uh, <coughs> asset for you. It's a coal electric, coal power generation plant. What is the likelihood, and I'm not the expert, of you being able to build another coal generation plant in today's EPA standards? And my point to you is. Well, that was the whole reason we wanted to buy into it, right? Huh? That was the whole reason we wanted to buy into it, right? So you grandfathered in and you'd have the, uh, the sunset provisions in place and then be allowed to use that to the maximum of its capacity until it was defunct. I'm not here to argue whether we went into it or not into it. What I want you to be aware is that as a city need, as city grows, the needs grow. And one of these days, you're gonna have an unexpected, we have to make an unexpected investment. And my question to you is, how do you, are you prepared to make that unexpected investment? And when people tell me, there are a lot of moving targets. There's not a specific reason why you do certain things or not. From the big picture, you need to be aware of that. You're just trying to show us the lay of the land and ed educate the public as to what mm -hmm. issues are before us and why certain decisions are being made or considered at this time, correct? That's right. Thank you. Uh, we, get cons we worry on your behalf. You're trying to tell us that we need to be uh, fiduciaries mm -hmm. uh, to plan ahead for the unknowns and also for the knowns and to be fiduciary responsible to make sure we maintain it okay, and have the resources to meet any challenge, whether it's capital improvements. Uh, That's all it is. Or disaster. Yeah. So and you're only going to be equipped in doing that if you know how all this works. And that's all I'm trying to tell you. And, and it's not just one factor. Mm -hmm. And it's not just one factor. Yeah, exactly. It's not one factor. When people tell you, oh, you got all this debt, and, and, and people do tell you that. Well. But have you taken into account how much it's worth? Exactly. Oh my goodness, that's why you I have all the sales this. tax issue. I mean, I'm that's, sorry? A, that's another moving part. You have to look at all the <coughs> revenue sources and all the moving factors. You're looking at, okay, well, yeah, we're, we're down $40 here, but we're picking it up because people have expendable cash because we have low rates and we have a very impoverished population. So. Well, do you think that CPNL cares? And I'm not worried about CPNL. I'm worried about PUB at this point. No, you're worried about your rate payer. Exactly. We all are. We're worried, we're worried about our investor mm -hmm. who is a citizen of Brownsville. So it's hard for me to challenge you any differently. I understand, but there's nothing to be embarrassed about. One thing is being not $40 below, another thing is being below 35. Why can't you be at $98? I'm not suggesting, and I'm not suggesting that you go to 98, I'm just telling you, you are the fathers and mothers of this community, and you need to be aware of how much money is out there. And it might actually be the lowest. And then, as I take you further down, in that... Well, I think I remember being here, and they were talking about uh, basically increasing certain revenues on... Uh, what was it? The, uh, the, we were going to pick up all this money based on uh, new construction and, and uh, impact yeah. fees. Oh, the, well, the impact uh, fees. There's no construction going on, so you know, all, of those, all of those projections are out the window, and nobody oh, can yeah. afford them. So nobody's building, and so we have none of that revenue. 
So that, that was a whole. Uh, that's you know. why we felt that if you were going to do the impact fee increase, that would that it should be based on a, on a staggered or layer impact rate increase to to figure out the tolerance of the consumer, the fellow who wants to build. It was not a matter of just trying to capture all this money. I think there's a resistance. It was based point. on perceptions of what economic growth would be, and those e and those economic growth figures were, were greatly exaggerated based on reality. And there's a resistance. And hindsight's 2020. Yeah, I mean, sure. so, so and, and I'll disagree with, with the economic projections being off. Sure. For the moment they are, but the city is going to grow, and the land use plan that we have is a reality. It's going to happen, whether it takes five years or eight years. Yeah. We need to be prepared to meet the challenges of providing for sewer for those new connections, providing electricity at a, at a competitive rate mm -hmm. to where the citizens are not comparing and saying, hey, how come, you know, why not deregulate and let others come in because you're higher than everybody else? Sure. We need to have the money to invest, to maintain the system where it's uh, operating most efficient, less costly, and most productive for the citizens around. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, Commissioner, you tell me about the electric rates and what they are and, and versus CPNL. The beauty of it is that somebody from Brownsville, I'm from Brownsville, but I don't live here anymore, but you know, it's so neat to come up here and tell you, hey, my rates are too high. And you can do something about it right here. You can't do that anywhere else in this valley. So that, you know, we got that's an that's an asset, it's an advantage, take advantage of it, do something about it. And and, and then my point was page nineteen, when you look at the base of PUB, it's not electric only. It's water and sewer. And when you look at the water and sewer, you look at Brownsville rates, literally for the last seven, eight years that we have up there, on 10,000 gallons of wastewater consumption or water consumption, and look at those rates, and they're pretty much at par with everything out there. And what I wanted to show you was, that's water and sewer, but if you, if you look at the combined charges in 09, you're like at $58 per 10,000 versus San Benito at 64, versus Harlingen at 59, and then McAllen and Edinburgh way below you, okay? And McAllen and Edinburgh are subsidized by other means, which is gas, uh, revenues, <coughs> and stuff like that. I, I also think, Mayor, that it is cheaper to treat the water up there. I mean, they're higher up the river, and it's, by the time you get it down here, it's a little bit more, well, I won't say the word, but I think it takes a little bit more to treat We're the water. We're at the end of the river. I'm sorry? We're at the end of the river. Yes, yeah, right. More like uh, at the end of the I wish you had said <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I think I, I messed this up. No, you made, um, early on when you were given the, your report, you mentioned three things that the city could do. And um, well, I'd like to think there's, there's a couple other things that the city could do. Sure. And one, one is you're providing the statements, the financials, revenues, and expenses, and all this information. Um, but I think one of the things, I think for me at least, um, that we don't know, and I think the city should mandate that PUB do the following, or we should ask a entity or a group to assess PUB top to down and left and right because we need to identify whether staff makes sense, whether products that we purchase make sense versus what are the plans that are in place make sense and look at that entire mechanism and, and assess it as it should be, um, as we should do in every department. City and other entities, they, they do the same. Um, we don't know that and we should and I think there should be this external group that does that so that the people will know that, yes, we're operating as efficient as possible and we're generating as much revenue as possible so that we don't come to this point where this is what we're gonna have to do because we're not, we're not gonna be able to meet the needs down the road. That's one. Two, um, two is the issue of, um, there's always been these, there's always been the, I think between the commission and PUB, um, the, uh, the, the lack of information or being aware of certain things, um, you know, and, and, and sort of a, of a division between staff and, and, and this group for whatever reason. And, and that too needs to change. That too needs to be more open, more transparent, so that, you know, we're all on the same page. We all understand what we need to do, what's asked of us by the constituents and PUB as, you know, the individuals that are obviously producing and generating this information. Uh, on a daily basis, we need we need to know that we need to be able to access that information. And when you say um, we, do you mean the city commission? I mean the city commission, right? Because again, we get asked constantly, and without thinking, why? Well, well, I really don't know. But you know, we're going to talk about it on Tuesday night. Well, that really doesn't work. You know, some of this information that we just got right now, and you're presenting it. Well, you know what? That's not that's not good enough. You know, this information should have been brought to the commission prior. 
And it's not a, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, negative or, or, or you know, or, or sound, you know, attacking, but I just want to make it clear that I think this is part of the reason of some of the things that need to change. Because, mm -hmm. again, as you all are aware and have everything at your disposal, we should too. Yeah. And I think well, again, that's going to help us sure. help us move forward. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying some of this information would be good to have in our in our Friday packet. So when we are over the weekend reviewing our information for Tuesday's meeting that we know. Sure. And at the same time, the, the communication lines, one, you know, John presents our, his weekly report to us every week. Sure. Well, that's great. It wasn't done before. Well, now it is. Things like that. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I, I think it comes in, in great light and, and I've been criticized a lot worse, but my <laughs> objective here today was just to give you a, a total overview of how the PUB is really working not only for the city, but for its ratepayer and its taxpayer, who after all is the owner. This is sort of like the last page. Real and quick, Noe, I, and I appreciate you doing that to uh -huh. let some of us know what exactly you're doing. But at the same token, you also have to come over here representing PUB. Are, are y'all coming to rep, rep to, to ask for a rate increase? Because it passed at the PUB board. I think, Mayor, you voted for, the, for a rate increase. Is that what, what this is about? Is that you're, you're presenting this so we can Go through with the rate increase. I'm trying to make you. I don't. Come I know you're, you're you're educating us on on this, and I sure. appreciate that. As far as coming from the city's aspect, Let me but from PUB's I, aspect, yeah. are are you also geared to come and tell us that this is why they need the rate increase and we should go with the rate? Well, let increase? me just say no, this. No, no, let me answer. Go ahead. We have. I'm asking him. We have a fiduciary responsibility sure. to keep the city abreast as to what the needs are of Nobody's PUB asking. to maintain the system and maintain competitive rates. Whether the city adopts rate increases or not, that's up to us here. They can only recommend based on the planning of PUB, okay, and based on the planning of the city. So why do you vote for a rate increase? Because that's the responsible thing to do. Whether oh. you agree with it or you don't agree with it, that's besides the point. Even though you're we entitled, got, you're entitled even to though we got oh, you need to million listen, dollars. You need to listen to the professional who makes a living guiding PUB and the city Okay. in his financial planning and to meet those obligations based on his recommendations, okay, oh. staff's recommendations, management's recommendations, and the needs of the system, I voted for that increase. Okay. Now, you don't have to agree with it, but listen to the expert. He's the expert. I'm not the expert, and you're not the expert. And was all Mr. these things, uh, you know, real quick, was all these things taken in the hand of uh, $146 million that, that we got from stimulus money? The, the lawsuit that we just settled, and all these in there, and during the time when people need to hold on to their money right now, is it a good time to come before us and ask for something that, instead of tightening our, our, our belts and looking for other alternatives, is, is, is this the right time to, to come for it? Well, uh, well, that's what I gotta protect. Well, actually, I only have good. one question before we answer it. Sir, you're just here to give us the information. We have yeah. to make the policy decision, right? Yeah, right. So at the end of the day, it's up to us what we do. Well, I mean, you're providing the information, and we have to then tell my, the, my wife digest what to it. Sometimes. <laughs> well, let me just say this to you, Commissioner. I think at the night that the board approved the rate increases, it was uh, a four-three vote, right? It was a four. I, I was real concerned about the message. The message was simply, from our perspective. Now take take my background. I'm a banker, and right now bankers don't have the best of reputations out there. But you're kind of like lawyers, right? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think no. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, you know, bankers, the people that are lending you money, all they want is more cushion. They want more more comfort. They don't want to lose their sleep in your ability to pay them back. So the only way you're going to do that is two ways: either you cut expenses, or you raise revenues. I'm all about raising revenues all the time. So for someone to say, am I here to recommend to you to have a rate increase, I really want you, because it falls into the gray area of policy making. In order for you to make right policy, in my opinion, you need to be educated about all the factors that can come into play. It is not my, I can tell you, you should raise the rates. You should, but I'm not here. Just because I say I should, should go that you should follow me and, and fall right. off the cliff. You need to just appreciate the fact that when I take you to this page 20, for example, and you put all the water, sewer, electric rates combined, 
and you look where you are as a city, Brownsville on average is about $148 per visit. <coughs> and you look at everyone else, McAllen, Edinburgh, Harlingen, and San Benito, you're below them. And, and my point to you is there is a certain degree of room where you can move up if you so choose. But that is the power that you have. And when you mention, Commissioner, that you like to have maybe another committee, per se, uh, to sort of keep an eye on how processes are handled at PUB and, and be better informed. You know, it's one of the unfortunate things about the ordinance. The ordinance was done back in 1970, I believe. When was it? Uh, what, 70 or 69? Uh, you know, the one that instituted that the mayor oh, should be ex officio? <laughs> This is going back to the 40s or 50s. You know, the mayor is the only person of the commission that sits on that board. And it's really difficult for one individual not only to attend those meetings, attend these meetings, and also keep you informed. I mean, as the days have gone by, commissioners tend to be more engaging. And I mean, I applaud you for the fact that at least you do care about what's going on over there. And that if you feel like you're not getting enough information and that you should have somebody else another body to sort of be like the middle, it's hard to, it's hard to not agree that if, if you're gonna make a decision that you believe is difficult, but you don't have all the information in place, um, and you feel like you gotta have a committee, that's your prerogative, it's not my prerogative. I, think, I don't think it's gonna be, the rating analyst, the banker is not going to punish you for you attempting to be better informed as to how it is that the PUB should be run. But I wanted to tell you that even though you may feel confused and and a bit unnerved about how the system works, the fact of the matter is that on record, you should be proud of the system you have. Well, and Mr. Reynolds, I really yeah. appreciate you coming here. The other question I had was, when you started looking at what McAllen and some of these other cities have and what they charge, did you look at what the average income was for their, their residents? No, because I know that the standard of living in, in McAllen is a little bit higher, and mm -hmm. some of the other places up the valley, people have greater income. I mean, we are, based on the census numbers, well, I'll say this, Commissioner, but my point to you is not to, to tell you, oh, you need to do this and do that, and frankly, who am I to tell you, you deal with a lot of issues out there, you can manipulate data any which way. My point to you was... And, and that's irrelevant because it, it has, it's driven by capital needs, not by the income that somebody makes. It, <coughs> it, it's, how, where do we want to go? Well, well, Mayor, and, and that's what I want to get. Where do phase we want to go? Phase 22. Phase 22, we talked about how the rates work, revenues work, how much are we worth. Phase 22 looks at what are the five years needs for the PUV. And you're looking at about $190 million that they need to, to fund over the next five years. And you talked to me, uh, Commissioner Atkinson, about where does the money come from in terms of uh, the RR funding. Some of that RR funding, it was a big announcement, but only some of it is ap applicable in, during the next five years, and is I think reflected in there. So my point to you is, when you have all those needs, mm -hmm. just think about it like this. You're gonna fund some of this with cash, you're gonna fund some of it with grants, you're gonna fund maybe some of it with 0% loans, but others, open market. Mm -hmm. Open market meaning coming to, the, to borrow money from the open markets, and my, right. and my whole point is, there is no way, it's not human possible for you tonight, if this is the first time you've seen this, to make a decision later on about what you have to do. I grant you that, but I think you need to be aware, like anything else, that this is a big system and it's gonna need improvements. And the quicker you can get to getting comfortable in doing something to either increase revenues or reduce the expenses, the better. Because you got, this needs are not gonna go away. And if they, they can't go away because it's a system that if something happens to it and you don't take care of it, it's only gonna hurt you down the road, you're postponing agony. L let me no, ask wait, you me, a, qu a question too. Uh, <coughs> no, Commissioner, can I ask him one question? Sure, go ahead. Something that we had, I don't think you've mentioned at all tonight, yeah. um, and that would be conservation. You talked about cutting back or you're gonna have to pay more, but why don't we talk about con conservation? Why don't we talk about at PUB a plan to educate folks on you use less, you pay less, but this is what it would do for the city as a whole. You know, I know we're gonna get to this point where we're gonna have to vote on a rate increase, but mm -hmm. for the future, for you know, next year or next quarter, or however, we should know or we should have some con conservative plan in PUB for wastewater, for water, and electricity. And, and, and that should be something that 
whether there's a team or a, just a department devoted to that specifically, because I think that would help. I think that's going to offset whether whatever income you and you and I make, mm -hmm. um, and whether I can afford it or I can't. If I know that this is what I need to do for my household, and I know that you know ten or twenty others are just like me, then I think we could see some major, major savings on the system. Now I don't know that offhand, but that's why there has to be a group or some sort of a yeah. of a plan in place to kind of see how we, how we go. Which leads to my recommendation in the end, and it's something that I had the Before opportunity to the there, board. Uh, no, would you please show, if you can, if we do nothing, what's going to happen? Well, if you do nothing, uh, just off the top of my head here, if I recall, I'll take you to, uh, to that page 10. That page 10, you can take home and, and just look at it. But basically, I wish I had a little pointer there. You got gross revenues of $173 million. What's more important is adjusted revenue. It's adjusted revenue because whenever you sell a lot of electricity out there, there's a cost for the cost of good, like whether you're using coal, whether you're using gas. You gotta take the cost of the good that allow you to produce the electric power. So the adjusted gross revenue, look at that number, went from 119 to 106. Your maintenance expenses, this is the operating budget of PUV, literally. It went from 45 in, in 07, if my, if my eyesight is good. Then it went to, uh, to 51 million in 08, and then it, it went up to 53 and a half. If nothing is done, Mayor, and you have to borrow $190 million, which I don't think you do have to, that's adding another $15 million of mortgage payments annually. Well, how are you gonna be able to sustain that? And so, one of the questions, no, and I believe yeah. that, and I understand where you're going with that, Yeah. but about, I'd say four months ago, maybe yeah. it was three months ago, we had Mr. Brujak up here, and he was talking about funding sources for the Weir Dam, uh, dredging projects, st stimulus monies, other monies that would be coming available from the federal government, it might have, uh, you know, we were told that we were going to come back and we we're going to be looking at those issues, what was going to happen with those monies, and we didn't hear anything more about that in front of the public, and the next thing we get is you coming up here saying, well, we have to raise rates because, well, we need this $190 million over X number of years, which may be true, but as you said earlier, there are other sources of monies, there are federal grants, there are stimulus monies, and there's also rate increases if we have to get to that point. But you have to look at all of the moving parts before you say, this is the one I'm gonna do. And I appreciate you coming here and giving us all this information because I think we all needed you know, the information to understand the big picture. But I also think that we need to have Mr. Brugiak come up here again and say, what's the status of those $23 million or 23, 23 million? 46. 46, 46 million, okay. So what's the status of all that money and, and what access do we have it and how can we apply it versus some of the other projects that we had uh, picked out on before. Because what you're giving us is vital, but we need to look at all of the information before we can say, okay. boom. If you go to page 25, which well, is but my Please conclusion. finish what yeah. you were saying about doing nothing, because you had a projection of a 40 million shortfall, one. Two, the, as far as what Mr. Commissioner uh, Trani is saying, the, the, uh, the uh, stimulus money was applied to the, to the capital improvements and the rates were reduced based on that stimulus money. That was taken into account into the proposed rates. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you know that. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the proposed rates already takes into account the grants that were received. So so, some of it, Mayor. I don't think all of it, but, but that's okay. Go ahead. Or um, it's yeah. applicable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find your presentation very easy to follow, and, and I'm learning a great deal. And I would very much like to know where the stimulus funds fit into all of this. Is sure. that in your presentation? Or my first question is that is that in your presentation or is that coming later? And my second question is, will you make it a habit of coming regularly to educate us like this? Because this has been very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, regularly. thank you. The thank stimulus you. is in our second presentation tonight, which I think we probably ought to defer because of time, because that's another. I, I think I think that's a wise thing. We can bring that in the next and update. And yeah, and basically the rate study, we didn't do the rate study, that was done by Black and Beach. On page 25, those are five options that you have as to how you can, in our opinion, generate sustainable revenues to co fund capital projects and fund self-supporting M&O costs. So 
rate increases as provided by Black and Beach is not the only answer, which kind of goes to what Commissioner Camarillo was saying about having to review other options with maybe some other body or whatever. But in any event, I want to take the opportunity to, to first of all congratulate you for being so engaged, not being shy. I've never been, I've never come to this town and, and not be greeted oh, by, by shy people, <laughs> but uh, uh, you should be commended. I mean, you followed up pretty well. And if there are any questions you have, please don't hesitate to call in Larry Jordan, my partner, or myself. Uh, we represent, we believe, you first and the citizens of Brownsville, and this is very much part of the city of Brownsville. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you sir. for coming down. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, can we have a, a motion to table B? So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Camarillo. Second. Have a second. We made the second. Second. Commissioner Atkinson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Um, this rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Pastor Lance Austetter. Will you join me in prayer? You were the Central Christian Church. Welcome to yes, the Yes, sir. Thank you. Coming. Thank you for inviting me. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to serve our community and our city. Uh, we pray for each one that's been elected. We pray for wisdom and sound judgment. Lord, we ask that we'll show respect for one another, even when we disagree. And we pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You have to pronounce your name right, host editor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, we'll go into the mayor's report. I'll provide a <coughs> synopsis. Uh, I went to Ciudad Victoria. Uh, I met with the governor yesterday. Uh, again, on the Weir and the River Walk, which he's much interested in. Uh, participated in Earth Day. Uh, we also had a pause adoption. It was uh, awesome. It was a great event uh, there along with the flea market uh, Saturday. Um, Gus Vena passed away and uh, went to the funeral. Uh, he was part of this community. Uh, well known and well liked. The, the, the funeral was attended it spoke for itself, the friends he had, and how much he will be missed. Our condolences to the family, the Reina family. Uh, and uh, we had um, uh, functions that I attended uh, throughout uh, the past two weeks. Um, PB meeting, um, an event with the chamber, uh, the 409 gallery. Uh, I want to encourage people to uh, learn more about the 409 gallery. Uh, for those who are into uh, culture, art, music, uh, it's on Sundays afternoon. Uh, it's a great gathering of people there uh, to relax and listen to music and appreciate uh, the art world. Uh, it's here on uh, 12th Street between Levy and, and Elizabeth Street. Uh, I wish more people would attend it. It's well attended, but uh, I would like to see more people there. Um, meet, met with people on requests or complaints, forward them to management or the proper uh, departments uh, and had some meetings during the week and uh, it, I felt it was a productive week. Uh, I want to thank all those who have come up to me and uh, expressed uh, their best wishes to me. I'm very touched by it um, and I'm very grateful to their support and uh, that's my report. Commissioner's report. Commissioner Rose uh, Gowan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening and uh, on the front of wellness. Um, I would like to thank very much the PUB, um, curiously they were here tonight, for a wonderful Saturday function last Saturday at the HEB on Butta This Line Road. They organized a three-level um, approach to wellness and engaged hundreds of people that were shopping at HEB, including our um, Biggest Loser contestants. Um, they, they really went all out and had all sorts of door prizes and gave away a bicycle, had several staff members organizing very informative talks including the importance of taking your medication and why it's important to eat breakfast and many others. 
This coming weekend, there will be a, uh, the Port of Brownsville will be sponsoring a free 5K run and one mile, uh, and one mile uh, run walk at the Port of Brownsville. Registration starts at 7 a.m. and the run or walk begins at 8. There will be t-shirts provided by the Port of Brownsville for, uh, I believe it's the first 300 or so um, contestants. And as I said, it's free, all in an effort to um, participate in the initiative of wellness that's spreading through the city. Finally, I'd like to, re to uh, let you know that Stephanie Garza and John Rodriguez, our city grant writers, are busy writing grants um, probably as we speak. The Pepsi company now is hosting what's called the Pepsi Refresh Project. And Pepsi is giving away millions of dollars in grants uh, for worthy causes that are voted upon by individuals like you and I. So becoming, beginning on June the 1st, the city will be uh, re entering a particular grant, different one every week, uh, from now until the end of the year. So we will be distributing that information and uh, you can go online as a commissioner, as a citizen, as a whatever, and vote uh, every single week for Brownsville. So I think that it's important that we come together as a community and do just that, vote for Brownsville and get, uh, and get some much needed funds into projects like the museums and infrastructure and gardening and many other needs that are here in the city. Yes, real quick, as far as District 2, I just wanna uh, let people know on Old Port Isabel Road, I think it's a road that Commissioner Samoa and I um, split. That street's being worked on, so it should be fixed in the near future. We just finished Kings Highway, over there leading toward Oliveira Middle School and Egley Elementary. That road was pretty bad, and we're fix we fixed that street, and we have a little bit more to go on it, but it should be done this summer. Also, um, as far as the sports park, April 22nd, Thursday, we have um, um, uh, world champion sand volleyball player, Kosh Kura. Is that his name? I always, say his, I always say his name wrong. But he's coming down here. He's going to open up our Beach Cove. Uh, we, we, we would appreciate it if a lot of people show up for that event. It's gonna, we'll have sand volleyball all during the summer, and it'll be thanks to the efforts of the BCIC board and our commissioners who have uh, backed us up on... on, on trying to provide a better place out there in the Brownsville Sports Park. Uh, for those of you who don't know and haven't read the paper, uh, the city signed a contract with the Rio Grande Valley uh, Bravos. They're a, a tier one professional soccer team. They'll be housed at the Brownsville Sports Park. So we're real excited about that because, you know, we have the best soccer teams, in, in, to me, in Texas and in, in the nation. And we have it at the elementary level, we have it at the junior high level, we have it at the high school le level with our uh, state champions that we've produced from Lopez and Porter. We're, UTB has gone a long way, and, and, and now we had an another tier to offer. So a lot of people are enthusiastic about this team moving to Brownsville. Uh, so I'd like to, to just congratulate them for picking Brownsville. And, and they saw what a gem the sports park is and, and what we're doing to try to just elevate it because the future is sports tourism. You know, we have 99% great weather. If we don't take advantage of that, then there's something wrong with us. All right, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, the 5A UIL Regional Tournament for, for, for high school is gonna be here, held here next year too. So everyone in Texas is gonna know what Brownsville is and what Brownsville is about. We're considered the soccer mecca of Texas, and we gotta start acting like it. So, uh, one more thing that I, that I um, put together real quick, I'd like to invite up uh, people from the Dormed uh, Ladies PGA Golf Tournament. They're here in town this week. They're real excited. There's over so many golfers from all over the world that will go back to their countries and tell them about their visits to Brownsville, Texas. And uh, we're, we're, this is their second year that they're here. And I, I thought it's, who, who better to sell Brownsville than us commissioners and get involved with, with what brings heads and beds, you know? And that's, you got a lot of hoteliers here and they're, they're excited that with, these, with this tournament comes a lot of opportunities to, 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 to put the heads and beds and help our hoteliers out and hopefully in the future we can provide 
more uh, opportunities through other events. But uh, we, uh, Bill Young was kind enough to, to help me and help Bean Ayala set up a proclamation, so I'd like to read that here. So if you all have it. Bean, you want to come up, Bean? I think we're doing a report right now. I know, but we'll do the proclamation after. It's, not, uh, it's, not on the, it's not on the agenda, so it's part of my presentation. So I'd like to read it. Thank you, Chuck. OK? And this was put in the last two, two days, so I, I, I wanted to just uh, show our appreciation from our city for these lovely ladies coming down here and playing golf in our, in our community. It's a proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, recognizing the historic Brownsville Open, an official event on the LPGA's Doormed Futures Tour. Whereas, for the second consecutive year, the City of Brownsville and its Convention and Visitors Bureau have hosted the historic Brownsville Open Golf Tournament, one of 16 sanctioned Doormed Future events, and whereas, more than 144 lady golfers from 28 countries are scheduled to play in this 50-hole tournament beginning April 23rd and winding up, winding down on April 25th. And whereas this event is one of 16 sanctioned developmental events on the Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. And whereas through the efforts of, this, of the Brownsville Convention and Visitors Bureau, this tournament is drawing worldwide attention to our city and will have a significant economic impact in our, on our community. Therefore, we, the members of the City Commission, the City of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by, by the charter of said city, and on behalf of our citizens, do hereby recognize the historic Brownsville Open, an official event on the LPGA Doormed Futures Tour, and offer our thanks and gratitude to the Brownsville Convention of Visitors Bureau for its role in bringing this event to our city. Done on this day, the 20th of April, 2010, signed by our Mayor, Pat Omala, and the rest of the City Commission. Thank you. On behalf of the, uh, the LPJ Tour, the Duramed Futures Tour, and the uh, 144 uh, players who are competing this weekend, I uh, just want to say thank you uh, to Mayor Amada and to the entire City Commission, as well as uh, Commissioner Atkinson for uh, this wonderful proclamation. Uh, it's our pleasure you know, to return to Brownsville each year, and we're looking forward to a, a wonderful weekend of uh, the City's hospitality and uh, the sense of community that we find every time we come to Brownsville. Uh, so thank you again for your support. We're looking forward to seeing all of you this weekend, and uh, we're looking forward to some fantastic weather and some great competition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you finished with your report? Yes, sir. <laughs> Two weekends ago, uh, we had a the TxDOT, uh, Texas Trash Off Bash. Um, we we uh, coordinated at the City's Recycling Center on uh, West Elizabeth Street. We had about 150 volunteers. I uh, want to thank all the individuals, the Boy Scouts that came out and, and the different clubs and organizations that came and participated and helped pick up trash. Uh, they did a great, great job, so I want to appreciate their efforts. Appreciate how the community's helping us out. ESD staff was great. And as always, uh, Public Works was always there to, to help uh, 
pick up after us and uh, and help coordinate uh, help coordinate the cleanups. I want to. I know the uh, last minute I wasn't here uh, because I was at a Keep Texas Beautiful conference, but um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate my, res my my support for the West Morrison Road. As you know, West Morrison um, is part of my district, and it's a major major artery in the in, in the area that that's very much needed to be opened. And as you all know that, uh, and which was probably explained at the last meeting. Um, but I fully support this project, not just from a, you know, just not just from traffic congestion wise, you know, for the community, although that's very important, but for the economic development um, that I think this project brings to the district and to the entire city of Bronzo. Um, so I appreciate the commission, the commission support for West Morrison. Uh, last Earth Day events, as you know, this is a, a real, real big week. Um, really excited about Earth Day. So many things and wonderful things that are happening around Bronzeville. Um, there's a calendar events that was that was produced um, and it's been tweaked a little bit, but there's quite. And each of the commission has a copy of events that are going on. Um, I know some of us will be at Walmart and HCB throughout on Thursday, uh, so I look forward to that. But throughout the week, there's a number of other events uh, that I hope you all would consider participating in and uh, and coming out and joining yourselves and 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 just again uh, supporting Earth Day in itself. Um, this Friday, we're going to have a movie night. It's going to, we're working in conjunction with the Student Life at the university. We're going to have an inflatable screen, and we're going to, have, we're going to show uh, Wally the movie uh, on, the, on the grounds of Dean Porter Park. So this is a great opportunity to bring out the families and, and kind of watch this movie. And, and we picked the movie. Um, well, I wanted another one, but they, this one made more sense um, <laughs> because it really just shows the kids. And, and the, the picture has a meaning about what we do with all of our trash and our waste and how it all piles up. And so I've never seen it. Uh, but it should be exciting, and I uh, hope you all can make it out there. And last, uh, on Monday, the university is having their second annual Seeds of Hope, the border wall, and uh, one year later. And basically, it's a, it's a panel discussion uh, that the president's going to give, and I think it's important to, to let you all know if you all can come out and participate and, and, and hear, what, hear what, they've, what they've done so far and what they go through and what we go through as a city. Um, I think it's very important for the community to be involved and engaged in something that's... Um, uh, really important to this community. That, com that concludes my report. Commissioner, would you like to promote the uh, April 22nd reusable bag day? How could I forget? Well, I know it's a proclamation coming up, but on Thursday, we are asking the entire city of Bronzo uh, not to use a single plastic bag. So I encourage each of you, wherever you are at on Thursday, to think about when you go to Stripes, and I'm gonna try to give a plug to Stripes, but wherever you go, and you're supposed to purchase something, and somebody wants to give you a plastic bag, please don't take it. Take it in your hand or bring your, and hopefully each of you will get your very own reusable bag, okay? So on Thursday, it's reusable bag day. So I encourage you all, please use your bags. Uh, many of the, the stores will be giving out their, the, their own reusable bags. HEB, Walmart will be giving out like 20,000 bags. Uh, so there's no excuse why any of us should be holding on to something that's plastic on Thursday. So again, I encourage you all, use a reusable bag. I want to thank Delina and uh, 4B and PUB for their efforts in helping us purchase 20,000 bags for the city of Bronzo alone. And this was done, again, <coughs> to help elderly, low-income folks of this community understand what the ordinance is about. And this is real important. Bronzo's on the map even more now because of what, we, what we've been able to do. And, and that was because of the mayor and the commission, and I appreciate their help, as well as healthy communities for taking the lead. Um, so, again, I want to thank Delina for helping us get the bags on time. Um, please use them and um, reduce, reuse, them? reduce, reuse, and recycle. Rethink. Rethink, excuse me. That concludes my report, man. Thank you for inviting the public to the uh, volunteer uh, reusable bag April 22nd. And hopefully they can do it and adopt it as part of their <laughs> everyday shopping. Uh, Commissioner um, Longoria. Thank you, man. On, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Commissioners Gowan and Camarillo for spearheading the, the wellness walks. And we had ours two weeks ago, at, or a week ago, at um, Lincoln Park. And I wanted to thank the Kinesiology Club, uh, Jay Garza and Orlando Garcia, who were at the library filming the commercial with me doing the invite. All the doctors that uh, turned out, uh, the, different the different faculty members from the university. And of course, Dr. Julieta Garcia and especially the civic engagement organization at the university for all of their help and everything that they did out there. It was a wonderful event. We walked around the university and I'll tell you what, walking around the university on a Saturday morning 
when not all the, when there's not there's not a lot of cars there and there's a lot of students, you're able to take advantage of nature at its best and the beautiful scenery and the beautiful wildlife that's all around the university. So that's truly our resaca systems are, you know, best to none in, in, in the whole nation. And it was just a really enjoyable event. It was a real nice day. We had a wonderful day. I thought it was going to rain, but thank God it didn't. And we just had a, it was, I, in my opinion, it was a very, very successful event. So thank you to both of you for spearheading this, this event. Um, as stated, we're going to have a, a meeting at the Southmost Community Center in mid-June. We haven't finalized the day, but we will within the next week. And it's going to be a two-day event for just in case you couldn't make it the first night, if you can make it out the second night. And it's an invitation to everybody from the community, and especially from the Southmost community, but it really, it's, it's an open, uh, please come listen. I will be having invitations for staff, for our directors, and, or for a representative of your department to come out and listen to the, the needs of the community. And we'll, like I told you, we'll be announcing that. Um, hopefully at the next meeting I'll be announcing it, that we have a concrete date as to when those reports are going to take, uh, when those, this activity is going to take part. On my District 1 update, uh, basically we're looking at right now uh, members of Public Works and Engineering, we're going out and doing surveys on the streets and what we need so that we can bring a more detailed report to CDBG funding to Ben Medina and so that we can start addressing all of these situations that we have. Our major concern in Southmost has always been streets and it continues to be streets and that's what we're working on right now and that'll conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Longoria. Uh, just a reminder uh, to everybody, please fill out your census form. It's very important. That's where we get federal dollars for, for uh, our quality of life projects here. Todos que llenen la forma del censos es muy importante para poder obtener los recursos federales para los proyectos que necesita la ciudad para mejorar la calidad de vida de todos los ciudadanos de Brunswick. Also, Cameron Workforce has opened up a satellite uh, on Southmost, 5636 Southmost Road. It's about a half mile past McDonald's on the right side. Uh, for those who uh, want to uh, seek the uh, satellite, please go there, 5636 Southmost Road. Para la gente que vive en la Southmost, hay un satélite para el departamento de Cameron Workforce, para la gente que necesita asistencia, entrenamiento, uh, que vayan a la 5636 Southmost. Es pasando el McDonald's en la Southmost como una media mía al lado derecho. That concludes the reports. Next to uh, I'll go on to proclamations. <coughs> Catherine Stillman Day. Uh, Catherine Stillman Day will be May 1st, but if, uh, we issued a proclamation on behalf of the city recognizing Catherine Stillman Day and her legacy, and we are awarding a person who is uh, well deserving in, because of her humane uh, treatment of animals and her effort to preserve life and to make sure that uh, pets are adopted instead of euthanized. Uh, the, the recipient this year with uh, along with in conjunction with the Stillman family, uh, the city is recognizing Dee Lubinsky. Is she here? Is she here, Dee Lubinsky? She's not here. Uh, Gerardo, do you know anything about it? Uh, Stella, do you know if she was contacted? Yes, she was. I don't know if she's coming, though. Okay. She will be awarded Saturday, uh, May 1st, but we'll read it here and then present it to her <coughs> on May 1st at uh, the Stillman Park. If the Stillman family will come forward uh, so we can uh, uh, read it and present it and then uh, officially give it to her on uh, Saturday, May 1st, or <coughs> the Stillman Day.
proclamation of the city of Brownsville, Texas, celebrating Catherine Brown Stillman Day on May 1st, 2010 in our city. Whereas Catherine Brown Stillman was born on September 22nd, 1923 in Dallas, Texas, and after extensive education married Dr. James Stillman in New York City in 1952 and subsequently raised three children, Alexander, Valerie, and Richard. And whereas in 1958, Kathy and her husband, a great grandson of the founder of Brownsville, moved to Brownsville when she, where she began a life of public service, community activity, and, as a gen, and generous to worthy causes. Whereas Kathy's lifelong love of animals led to many years of financial donations to the Brownsville Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Laguna Madre Humane Society, and the Bite a Wee of West Hampton Beach, Long Island, New York. And whereas Catherine Brown Stillman was instrumental in the creation and eventual construction of the Brownsville Animal Shelter through her financial contribution and her gifts of time, energy, and resources will never be forgotten. And for this, we are eternally grateful. Now, therefore, we, the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city, do hereby proclaim May 1, 2010, as Catherine Brown Stillman Day in our city, and further add that she is remembered by all who knew and loved her, done on this, the 20th day of April, 2010. Welcome, City of Brownsville, Mayor, our honored uh, council members. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also am thanking in the level of my sister, Valerie, uh, who I know would like to be here today. I'm glad that I have the opportunity to say things are working very well with the uh, clinic that is out of town and the encouragement for larger pieces of property for our animals. When we have kindness to animals, it encourages the kindness of children, which are our community. It has to start somewhere. And with our community honoring the respect to animals and treatment, the children also learn that so that it, we, we teach these skills early on. So, my, my very kind tidings to all of you. Good afternoon. Maria V. Garza. Miss Maria V. Garza. A proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, recognizing and congratulating Ms. Maria V. Garza for her service to the community. Whereas Maria V. Garza is a native of San Benito, Texas, who married her husband Martin in 1960 and left the Rio Grande Valley for the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where they raised three daughters. And whereas Maria V. Garza attended college while working full-time, graduating with a liberal arts degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. And whereas during her time in North Texas, Maria V. Garza was active in local Democratic Party politics by hosting meet and greet parties in her home for candidates of county, state, and federal offices. She volunteered for phone banks, stuffing envelopes, and delivering yard signs. And whereas after retiring from the Dallas Independent School District, Maria and her husband returned to South Texas where she became an active participant in local affairs such as Pan American Roundtable and is the current president of the local chapter of the Texas Retired Teachers. And whereas in her spare time, Maria V. Garza enjoys golf and traveling and is looking forward to celebrating on May, 10, May of 2010, the 50th anniversary of her and Martin's marriage. Now, therefore, we, the members of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city and on behalf of all our citizens, hereby recognize Maria V. Garza for her accomplishments and service to her community done on this the 20th day of April 2010, signed by Mayor Pat O'Malley and City Commissioners. Uh, 
Mayor, City Commission. Thank you so much. I'm overwhelmed. It has been my uh, privilege to help other people and serve my community. Um, this is a total surprise. I just arrived back from Dallas yesterday where I attended the uh, TRTA convention. And um, I have been, uh, well, elected to be the first vice president for the district. Uh, I'm local president. The, the next step is the district and then the state level. So um, not only do I work with the retired teachers to make the, their quality of life better, but I also work with the Pan American Roundtable and other organizations. And on behalf of my family and myself, thank you to you and all the citizens of Brownsville. Blanca Perez Moreno. Mayor, commissioners, and to the citizens of Brownsville. As Mr. Baldomero Trevino was also recognized by the SBA, Ms. Uh, Perez Moreno was the female, the women's in business champion of the year. So at this time, I'd like to be able to read this proclamation in her honor. And this is a proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, recognizing Blanca E. Perez Moreno, 2010 SBA District Women in Business Champion of the Year. Whereas a native of San Antonio, but raised in Brownsville, and a graduate of Homer Hanna High School, Blanca E. Perez Moreno, has parlayed a career in the area of law enforcement into a successful and profitable business, Boogity Bears Partyland, built from the ground up in our city. And whereas in April of 1999, after eight years in the legal business, Blanca E. Perez Moreno took the risk of investing her savings in a new business and opening Boogity Bears Partyland. And in the ensuing, in the ensuing 11 years, has earned a place of respect in the community and in the Brownsville business world. And whereas since 1999, Boogity Bears Partyland has accommodated some 2,700 parties, providing entertainment for over 400,000 guests, and in the meantime, Blanca E. Perez Moreno has ventured into balloons and events by Blanca, where she applies her skills in balloon decor and is currently the only certified balloon artist in Cameron County. And whereas Blanca E. Perez Moreno has combined her success in business with an array of community activities, including volunteering for the United Way of Southern Texas, a child advocate for, the, for, for CASA, court-appointed special advocates, the City Transit Advisory Committee, Leadership Brownsville, and a member of the Community Fellowship Church and recently for the Citizens Advisory Board in Brownsville. And whereas in December of 2009, the Brownsville Chamber of Commerce nominated Blanca E. Perez Moreno for recognition as 2010 District Women in Business Champion of the Year and she has been awarded district recognition from a, from a seven South Texas County area by the Small Business Administration. And whereas during her, during her busy career, Blanca Perez Moreno has found time for marriage and is a proud mother of two girls, 14 and seven. And whereas Blanca Moreno is a fine example of the results that can be realized from determination, hard work, and a solid business ethic. Now therefore, we the members of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the Charter of said city, do hereby recognize and congratulate Blanca E. Perez Moreno and her family on her selection as a Small Business Association Women in Business Champion for 2010 and further wish her every success in all her future endeavors. Done this 20th day of April, 2010, signed by Pat Amada, Junior Mayor Brownsville and the City Commission. Congratulations.
Good evening. Um, thank you so much, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you so much, Commissioner Longoria. Um, I just want to um, thank you for this proclamation, um, and I share this with my family and my staff. I wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for their support. So I, I thank them, and I want to um, commend um, our Brownsville Chamber of Commerce for supporting me and members. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good evening. It's Earth Day, the next proclamation. Is somebody here from Earth Day to receive the proclamation? Well, y'all want to come first? Uh, Arnold Pettis? Mark is in El Paso. I think this should, this should be. There's Arnold. All right. <laughs> a proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, declaring April 23rd, 2010, Earth Day in our city. Whereas the first Earth Day was celebrated on April 22nd, 1970, with the goal of inspiring environmental awareness and encouraging the conservation, protection, and appreciation of our nation's natural resources. Whereas it is the responsibility of each of us to safeguard the environment by recognizing that, by recognizing all human life depends upon the earth and upon one another for our mutual existence, well-being, and development. And whereas the citizens of Brownsville are committed not only to protection and preservation of our environment, but also the restoration of our ecosystems and habitat. And whereas citizens of Brownsville, city staff, and all elected, city offic all elected officials are working closely with federal, state, and local governments with non-governmental organizations to develop and implement regulations and ordinances specifically designed to preserve and improve Bronzeville's fragile ecosystem and the quality of life therein. Whereas Bronzeville proudly recognizes all who participate in Earth Day for their dedication and taking a proactive role in shaping the future of our environment and protecting Bronzeville's precious natural resources. Now therefore we, the members of the City Commission of the City of Bronzeville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city and on behalf of all citizens do here proclaim April 23rd, 2010, as Earth Day in our city, and further urge all our citizens to be mindful of local, state, and national laws which protect our environment and to join in the efforts to preserve the beauty and wonder of the lands, skies, and, and water, water of all the earth. Done on this 20th day of April, 2010, signed by the Mayor Pat Umala, Jr. and the rest of the City Commission. The U.S. Uh, I would like to thank, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I would like to thank the efforts of the commission uh, for the reusable bag uh, emphasis on uh, on getting that out there, promoting the use of it, and, and, pro and making the proclamation for Earth Day. Thank you very much.
Abraham. Before I, uh, before I read the proclamation, I just want to, um, again, I want to congratulate the whole team uh, on the success that you have had, not just at this, this, this past this month's uh, Final Four, but in the years past and everything that this team has, has achieved and accomplished. Um, I will say that it's, it's very, it's very I'm very proud and um, excited to read the proclamation because, believe it or not, I was part of the first chess team at UTB TSC. Now, although I didn't win a game or a trophy, <laughs> I think I might have hurt the team or the university at the same time, but nonetheless, I learned a lot. Um, I learned what it was to represent the institution competitively. I didn't have a, I didn't have a great coach, yeah. Um, to rep we didn't have a coach, actually. Uh, we were teaching ourselves. The, the, the level of competition at chess was great, and that's what it was about for me. That was the rush, um, and I want to thank everyone who helped make this what it is. Believe it or not, you all are, you all are winners. And being successful on the boards equates to being successful in the classroom and in the community. And you're doing that. And you're showing that the young kids in Bronzo that are playing chess, they're gonna have, they're gonna have the same, and if not better. And so I wanna thank you all, I wanna thank the leadership, Rusty, the coaches, uh, and the institution for what they do to believe in a program that's about intellect and strategy because it's very, very important. And, and it's a product and it's something that's here to stay and uh, again, I'm very, very proud of you all, and I'm sure this won't be the last time that y'all come before us. And I'm sorry that it took us so long to bring you before the commission. Now, a proclamation of the City Commission of Bronzo, Texas, recognizing the UTB TSC chess team, whereas on April the 9th through the 11th, the UTB TSC chess team competed in the 2010 President's Cup Tournament, the Final Four of College Chess, and the Salon Casia in the Education and Business Complex on the college campus. And whereas teams competing in the tournament included the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, University of Texas at Dallas, Texas Tech University, and the University of Texas at Brownsville, Texas Southmost College. And whereas these entrants qualified for the final four of college chess by finishing as the top four U.S. universities at the 2009 Pan American Intercollegiate <coughs> Team Chess Champions Championships hosted by UTB TSC. And whereas on April the 9th, through the 11th, tournament play, UTB TAC placed second, only half a point out of the first place, winning its matches with UT Dallas, Texas Tech, and drawing with UMBC. And whereas representing UTB TSC were first board, Grandmaster Timor Garab, second board, GM Mauricio Flores, third board, GM Axel Bachman, fourth board, international master Max Cornejo, and alternates, WIM Nidia Ortiz and Luciana Morales. And whereas the team is guided by UTB TSC Chess Program Director Rusty Harwood and Coach Grandmaster Ron Harvey. Now therefore we, the members of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city, and on behalf of all the citizens, do hereby recognize and congratulate the UTB TSC Chess Team on its second place finish at the 2010 President's Cup the final four of, collegiate, of college chess, and further wish the team and its players great success in future tournaments. Again, done on this 20th day of April, 2010. Congratulations. Mr. Mayor, commissioners, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the recognition. I'd like you to know that wherever we play, we're always very, very proud to represent Brownsville. Um, chess is very important to our community. Um, as Mayor Almada said, you know, it, this is something that goes way back, and it's something that BISD has gotten behind and the city has gotten behind, and um, it's a great opportunity. It's brought a lot of positive um, recognition to our city. As we speak, there's a group out of California, Higher Ground Entertainment, that's working on a documentary and possible feature film about the Brownsville chess story. And um, during the final four, we had HBO down filming for Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. They're doing a segment on Brownsville Chess. It's going to be coming out next month. 
Um, so anyway, we're, I'm so proud of our students. They're, besides being great, great young people, they're outstanding students. We have a brand new coach, Grandmaster Ronan Harsfee, who we welcome to our community, and we look forward to representing Brownsville in the future. Thank you very much. Please join, join us, Arnold. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, a proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, declaring April 22nd, 2010, as Reusable Bag Day in our city. Whereas the City of Brownsville, Texas, recognizes that the use of reusable bags is an integral part in promoting a sustainable environment that involves all segments of the community, business, environmental groups, local government, and consumers, all working together cooperatively. Whereas the U.S. uses 100 billion plastic shopping bags annually, and an estimated 12 billion barrels of oil are necessary to produce these bags, and society's consumption rate is estimated at over 500 billion bags annually, or almost 1 million per minute, with 1 billion single-use bags are given out each day. And whereas the annual consumption of disposable plastic bags in Bronzeville area numbers well into the millions, while a high-quality reusable shopping bag has the potential to eliminate more than 1,000 plastic bags in our lifetime. And whereas the city's environmental advisory committee is working closely with local grocers to promote the use of reusable shopping bags, and whereas the city of Bronzo has encouraged, encourages reusable grocery bag usage in conjunction with local environmental outreach groups, and also encourages reduction of greenhouse gas emissions with the city of Bronzo using reusable shopping bags. Whereas the city of Bronzo and local grocers are promoting the use of reusable shopping bags, and on April 22nd, 2010, there will be a reusable bag trial run and shoppers are encouraged to make it a reusable shopping bag day. Now therefore we, the members of the City Commission of the City of Bronzeville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city, do hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2010 as a reusable bag day in our city and further encourage all citizens through their support behind this important, throw their support behind this important and most worthwhile effort. Done on this the 20th day of April 2010. And I hope everybody in the audience is thankful. I wish the entire city was here, but everybody here got a reusable bag. So very happy that now everyone here has a bag. Hopefully you out in the community will get yours too this week. I have to tell you all, I know the city has a lot of problems and there's a lot of things in the newspaper and issues, but this is really a good step. And you guys really need to go, get to know your public officials. Stop them on the street, call them, email them, talk to them, because they will listen to you. And I have to say that this commission has been very supportive, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that hears that. I have a wonderful committee that I work with, starting with Mr. Camarillo, Arnold, who works for public health, right? Public, public health? Or work, I get them mixed up with works. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just wonderful that we have dedicated non-paying commissioners and mayor who are willing to step up and help the city with some of the problems. Litter may be a very small problem, but it is a problem and they're willing to do that and we need to really support them with that. Thank you.
There's gonna, there's gonna be two of them the same one. It's just one read. Again, welcome, uh, welcome to our, welcome, welcome to your chambers. On Friday, we had I had the privilege of attending a press conference, which uh, most of you were at, which dealt with Senator Lucio um, talking about what what the state's trying to do um, in regards to child abuse um, and the recognition of the different agencies and different focus groups uh, that are going to be out in the community to help with this effort and to help bring awareness, but also troubleshoot some of the issues that, that, that you all face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I was proud to be there, proud of what Senator, Senator Lu Lucio Jr. is doing, um, and it was brought to my attention that we hadn't recognized uh, child abuse folks uh, for the month of April as being Child Abuse Prevention Month. So I'm glad you all are here, and uh, to be recognized as you should, uh, and understand that the city of Bronzeville stands with you all uh, on, this pressing, on this pressing issue, uh, which, is, which is extremely horrible and something we don't ever want to hear about or see. Uh, but regardless, we stand with you, and we look forward to helping you as much as possible in the future. A proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, declaring April 2010 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in our city. Whereas child abuse is a pervasive and complex national, state, and local issue, and resolving it depends upon the involvement and the partnership of all members of the community. And whereas the numbers of abused or neglected children continue to increase each year, the support of abuse and neglect of children has a significant adverse impact on our society. And whereas these young victim, victims of abuse and neglect often have no voice in decisions made that affect their lives. Whereas child abuse and neglect advocate, advocates of the Cameron County are dedicated to recruiting, training, and supporting individuals as part of the advocacy for abuse and neglected children. And many volunteers are dedicated individuals who give freely of their time and talents to speak up for abuse and neglected children. And whereas the successful programs for abuse and neglected children are effective because of the collaborative efforts among citizens, social service agencies, schools, religion, religious groups, law enforcement agencies, and the entire business community. And whereas breaking the cycle of abuse and neglect by protecting the children is the morally right thing to do and represents a significant investment in the future of our community and further assist in assuring the safety and well-being of all citizens, especially the most vulnerable who are children, should be a priority of our community. Now, therefore, we, the members of the City Commission of, the, of Bronzeville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested by the charter of said city, do hereby proclaim April 2010 to be Child Abuse Prevention Month in our city. Done on this 20th day of April, 2010. On behalf of Child Protective Services, Mayor, City Commissioners, we'd like to thank you for your support. Uh, we did kick off last week, the ch April, as being Child Abuse Prevention Month, Awareness Month, and you bringing this to the forefront with the City of Brownsville, we're very appreciative. And we look forward to coming again, maybe in the summer, maybe in the fall, because we really do need to spread awareness through our community that abuse is occurring in Brownsville and we just need your support and we need the citizen support to report any suspicion of abuse or neglect with children uh, in, in our city. Uh, also on behalf of the Children Advocacy Center, uh, Monica's and Maggie's house, we also like to uh, thank the board, I mean thank the Commissioner's Court for, for, for us being here today. Thank you.
할수 있겠죠. 안녕하세요. to help them pass a plastic bag ordinance. So Browns was again being talked about as to what is done in a proactive way uh, for the benefit of the community. And I think that speaks well of Brownsville and I'm very proud to be part of it. And on the uh, Catherine Stillman Day, uh, May 1st, uh, there will be an adopt-a-thon at the uh, uh, dog park there at the <coughs> animal shelter on Farm, on Farm Road 511. Uh, please go by and, and uh, there'll be a, a Uh, events there for children and, and dogs will be shown uh, that are up for adoption and uh, I think it'll be a fun time there at the park so uh, mark it on your calendar especially if you're looking for a pet to adopt you'll find a great pet there at the animal shelter that will be uh, available for adoption on May 1st which is Saturday at the Catherine Stillman uh, uh, dog park thank you uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda items consent agenda items A through C So Can I approve? have a motion to approve? Move. We have a motion by Commissioner Goya. Can I have a second? Second by Commissioner Zamora. Any discussion on any of them? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item five. Item five, public hearing and action on first reading of ordinance number 235-2010-004 to rezone from dwelling G to general retail G for lot one and two, block one of Camino Real subdivi sec section three located at 68 Camino del Rey. Our oh, Mayor, City Commissioners, that's the uh, property shaded in red, 281 and Camino del Rey right there in the intersection. The Planning and Zoning Commission voted unanimous to approve this application. Uh, it's for a retail store. Okay, this is a public hearing. Anybody against this in the audience? Put it close. Okay, second. let me call for, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go through the process. Okay, anybody want to speak on this matter? No? Okay, let me call for a close of the public hearing. Can I have a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close. Second. Motion to close by Commissioner Camarillo, second by Commissioner Atkinson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. This is an action item. Move to approve. Okay, second. let's not have a core chorus here. Let me ask for the motion. Person makes a motion, and then I'll ask for the second. Let's go. That's the way you run a, bus a business and the meeting, okay? It's not funny. Okay, can I have a motion? Move to approve. To approve. Can I have a second? Second. I have a second. Motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 